Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. I am back to my studio in Portland, Oregon uh, from my workshop for Day of the Dead and Mutual Con. Uh, and Portland's beautiful late fall weather, but, but freaking cold. Uh, and uh, so I'm here in the studio. This week, I wanna talk about really cool news from OM1. They've launched Photo Raw 2019. It's available to purchase and download and use. Uh, I've been playing around with the alpha version, the beta version. And it's really impressed me from a stability, usability, user interface enhancement, new features perspective. It's been a ton of fun uh, to see them to see them do a really good job getting a, a already great product uh, improved and out there. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. So I'm going to walk through some of the things I like uh, in Photo Raw 2019. Uh, demo a couple of things, and uh, and then I'll take a question or two. So. This is Approaching the Scene. I'm Hudson Henry. I'm a Portland, Oregon-based adventure landscape photographer uh, and photo educator. And this show is basically about all things photographic, whether it's the convergence of technologies for video, time-lapse stills, uh, conversations with working photographers about the state of the industry, uh, talk about new gear and technology, talk about capturing better images in the field and new techniques. Uh, to editing better photos and software and new software uh, solutions for editing your photos. Uh, all things photographic, and I would love for you to join the conversation. So you can send questions to questions at hudsonhenry.com. Alternatively, you can log on to the website at www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS and leave your question there. So I want to dive in, take a look at Photo Raw. Uh, and, and for those of you that haven't been using OM1 software or Photo Raw before or haven't seen it before, I mean, it is essentially a, a browser. You don't have to catalog your images. You don't have to import them. You can just browse through your folders. You can create collections that, that aggregate photos from different folders. It has a lot of metadata-based uh, capabilities without being a full-fledged, you know, relying on a database, you have to import your images. Uh, it has uh, some of the best of both worlds in that fact. And it has basically now come down to kind of two modules. We used to have a lot more. Um, and within your browse module, you know, you can view thumbnails larger and smaller. Uh, you just drag the slider right here. Um, you can also, we can easily close down either or both panels here to get a bigger view of our images as we run through and call. There we go, we're sliding nicely. We've got, you know, if I, if I roll down here, I have the first image my little boy Pike took. I still can't get his mother and him to smile uh, at exactly the same time, but I had him running around with my little Sony camera and he took a couple of great photos, both of me uh, and of my, my grandfather's best friend's son and a good friend of mine, uh, Rui, down in Michoacan. So you got kind of a, a grid view and a loop view. Uh, we've also got a uh, compare view where we can grab a couple of different images uh, and take a look at which one we like better. If we grab a whole bunch of images as we get rid of selects, the images that are left over will get larger and larger and easier to choose from. You know, but the basic proof in a raw processing piece of software and finishing software piece like this is how it works with raw processing and finish editing images. And one of the things that I really, really like about Photo Raw and that I think has been improved uh, in this 2019 version is kind of the intuitive way that it goes about doing that. You've got a develop section and effects section, which is really finishing edits a portrait module and a local adjustments module. And, and so if you think about develop is for those big global raw processing adjustments. Local adjustments are if you just wanna differentially adjust one part of the image over another. Portrait is for particularly working with faces and portrait images, and effects is really for finish editing. One of the neat things about effects and local adjustments is that they're layered and masked. We'll get into that in a minute. And it's all raw, it's all non-destructive raw editing. We're not mangling any pixels. We're not permanently changing our file. So, you know, here's an image of Stacy and Pike and Michoacan, my wife and my son, where, you know, it, it's a tough exposure with that backlight and the camera's protecting the highlights by, by you know, really blocking the shadows out a bit. So let's see how good a job it does. You know, we'll set some black points and white points here. If I hold down my J key, 
and, in, and, and lower the black point, I'll see that clipping mask as we start to blow the shadows. I don't mind having a little bit of black in my image. Uh, if I go ahead and pull the white slider down a bit and then the highlight slider, I can go ahead and get rid of that clipping in the whites. I'd rather not have any pure white in my frame. And then let's see what happens when I run the shadows up. You know, really nice job uh, with the raw processing here. And I've got this mid-tone slider that I can kind of adjust to, to taste. You know, a nice job uh, raw processing an image that, that really needed a little help straight out of the camera. Um, you know, it does some neat things if we jump back into browse. Right off the bat with straight raw files, I've got three here that I've marked yellow because I was in such contrasty conditions uh, that it was, I wanted to get a Sunstar shot of this cathedral that's been buried by lava. Uh, this is one of the world's youngest volcanoes. It's called Paracutin. It completely inundated this town down there. Uh, but the conditions were really, really harsh backlight right here for the shot with the lava and the volcano in the background of the cathedral. So I bracketed, handheld. Uh, and, and what I'm gonna do here is just in browse, I've got the three images selected. I've marked them as yellow, which is my indicator that they're HDR capture, um, bracketed HDR set, and I'll just click this HDR button. I'm not even gonna touch a slider for raw processing. Uh, and on one's gonna come up with its HDR merge dialog, and look at that, just right out of the box. You know, I've used it before, and it knows that my natural setting uh, I like a nice, clean, natural look without a lot of adjustments built in. One of the nice things with Photo Raw is you can choose, you know, for exposure purposes, which one do I want to set as the base exposure? Would I like it a little more underexposed to, to kind of protect highlight details? Uh, or would I like to use the more exposed one as like the base to start from raw processing? But I'll still have all those tones in there. If I grab the shadow slider, you can see how easily I can pull that shadow detail up. Just that simple. So I won't go ahead and build that one, but you see how easy it is to do that. Um, so, you know, let's go in and let's actually edit a portrait because a portrait can show off a little bit more of the software as a whole. I've got this portrait uh, of this woman that I met in Pascuaro, actually on the Noche de Muertos. Um, and she was just a really wonderful model, and she was really, really uh, game to model for our whole workshop group. Um, so we took some really lovely photos of her. I, I have some of my favorite photos from this trip uh, are of her and, and her um, boyfriend modeling in this beautiful old walled area with gates and, and arches uh, in the older part of Potsquare. Well, the whole city of Potsquare was old, but... Uh, beautiful old city. So, you know, the first thing I would do is start out here in develop for my global adjustments. And whenever I'm working with sliders in, in a raw processing engine, I like to have the sliders a little bit wider. You know, I want to be able to see a nice big image still. I'm probably going to jump to my loop view to get an even slightly bigger image. But I want to have some, some, some uh, tactile feel to these sliders. And you'll notice one of the really cool things, I mentioned that layers is kind of dropped out. If you're a photo raw user from 2017 or 2018, you'll see that everything's kind of conglomerated here. We've got develop, effects, portrait, local, and we also have layers, which is really cool. I, I can actually uh, add, it gives you a little note here, but I can blend multiple raw files non-destructively. You're not gonna do anything to the original raw file, but I can literally go in here and add backgrounds or textures if I wanted to. Um, you know, all kinds of things uh, to this image. I could combine two raw photos. I could align raw photos and, you know, paint shadows captured differentially for exposure from one into another. There's a whole bunch of different things I could do, and it would just create a brand new dot on one raw file with that completely non-destructively re-editable set of layers, masks, whatever. I can add as many different layers as I want. So that's one really cool thing. You could develop two different layers differently. You could, you could copy the main layer and differentially uh, edit one and another. It's, it's just a lot of power right here that's all raw. This is a big change for Photo Raw 2019 is bringing layers into the raw workflow and being able to non-destructively work in layers. You know, the first thing I, I might do in this image, I know I'm gonna wanna crop it because I've just got her too centered up. So I'm gonna go ahead, oop, I grabbed the, grab the edge over there. I want to actually grab the, the corner. Oops, I didn't want, to, didn't want to do that. What I want to do actually is just uh, 
grab my edge here and drag it in a little bit. I'd like to take her a little bit off uh, center and I'll pull the top edge of my cropping frame down just a bit. I don't want to crop into her, her crazy crown of roses here, but you get the picture. We cropped in just a little bit, kind of just brings her a little more front and center, fills the frame a little bit better. And I like her being off center and more of a rule of thirds position a little bit. And then I'm going to want to set my black point and my white point. And again, I'm going to hold the J key down as I drag these most basic of sliders until I start to lose the highlight detail that I'm worried about. And I can actually see right in her kind of eye jewelry here. I don't want to, I, those are sort of specular highlights, but I don't want to blow them out too much. I can go with just a little bit of pure white in that eye jewelry, but not too much. And then the same thing with the shadows. You know, I'm fine with her choker kind of having a little bit of pure black in it. Um, and then we'll just play with shadows a little bit. Maybe we brighten the shadows, just bring a little more detail out of the shadows. Real subtle touch. The camera did a really nice job. This is shot with my Nikon D850. Pretty much my favorite camera I've ever used in my life. And then we'll pull highlights back just a little bit. It's looking pretty good. I might just play with contrast. Again, as I move these sliders, I'm not looking at the slider. I'm looking at the image and its effect and just choosing where it appeals to me the most. So that basically, you know, I feel as if the white balance is pretty good out of the camera. I might just warm it up just slightly. Um, and that's about all I'm going to do. I don't want to sharpen a portrait image. She looks plenty sharp to me in this photo. Um, you know, and sharpening portrait images just tend to bring more texture out in the skin. So speaking of skin, let's do a little portrait work here. Uh, and I think that's the next thing I want to do is jump right here into the portrait tab. And it's seen her face right here. We're going to click on her. And then I can adjust what portion it wants me to say is her eye. So I'm just going to click right on the center of her pupils here. Whoop. I'm going to move that one just slightly so that photo raw knows where her pupils are. And then I can, I can adjust this a bit. So I can move the corner to really match the corner of her eye and put these where her eye meets her eyelids. And you can see it really does a nice job of naturally putting itself in the shape of a human eye from different angles. I, I don't know exactly how they did that, but as I move this corner piece down, I think you'll be, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And then as I move that over, I think I can get the shape just about perfect there. So we've got pretty much her eye delineated, maybe move that corner in just a little bit. And then we'll have a look at her mouth. It wants me to click both corners of her mouth. So there's one corner, there's another corner. That's a little trickier, especially with the angle that she's at. So I'm just going to kind of adjust that to the edge of where her lip meets her face at her top lip. Um, she doesn't really have any teeth showing, so we're just going to put those lines where the teeth would be, sort of right together down the center line of her lips. And there I think we've done a pretty good job delineating her mouth. And here's the craziness. So if there were any blemishes, this would remove the blemishes. She doesn't really have any blemishes that aren't artificial, uh, that aren't, you know, for decoration. Um, skin smoothing, you can see it starts to kind of take that texture out of her face a little bit. It's already doing some. If I turn it off, you'll see there's quite a bit more texture and slightly in the makeup there. Um, there's an evenness slider. She looks pretty even to me. Plus the makeup, we want some unevenness. Um, and then the eyes, there's a whitening slider. We can get her eyes looking whiter, making them a little brighter. It kind of gives a little bit of a, of, a, um, of a feeling like we lit her a bit. And then detail, we can just make her eyes just a little bit sharper. Even though we're softening the, the, the structure in her face, you know, the pores and whatever skin blemishes there might be, we're sharpening her eyes. It knows right where her eyes are. And the same thing, if she had her teeth showing, we could whiten her teeth. We could uh, bring up the lipstick's vibrance just a little bit. And when you look at what this looks like before and after, it's pretty dramatic. It's just a nice little change just applied to her skin, essentially. So jumping back to fit, it's subtle, but it definitely makes a difference right there. Uh, so that basically is that. If I wanted to do any local adjustments, any dodging, any burning, I would jump into local, but I, I don't think I need to in this image. The exposure is pretty darn good. Um, and I'm going to instead go into effects. And in effects, 
you know, I think I'm going to, I don't want to add any dynamic contrast. If I did, it would sort of undo a lot of what we just did to her skin tones. You know, I, I might like what that's doing to the roses uh, and to her, her shirt, but I don't want to be adding any contrast to this beautiful out of focus detail or to her face. You know, so one thing I could do here, this is, as I said, a layered masked workflow. So I could just invert the mask and where it shows black, none of that effect is coming through. So now this is doing absolutely nothing to the image, but I could take my masking brush and tell it I want to paint in really softly. So I choose an opacity that's like 20%. Uh, with 100% feather, so it's a nice soft edged brush. You won't see any any hard edge where I'm painting, and just kind of paint some of that contrast into just the flowers in her hair, um, and then to maybe into her her shirt, her blouse. You know, you could literally just paint a little bit of contrast in there. You can just pick out details that you want to add contrast to micro contrast, sharpening, just kind of a, a little bit of a, a pop. So now if I click this on and off, super subtle, but you definitely see a little bit more punch in the flowers and in her, and in her blouse. Um, you get the idea, you can just paint in and out. Another, uh, I might do a color enhancing filter. And I'm just, I, I love this desert um, setting of this. So if I hit desert, it's it's just bringing a little bit of warmth out. It does a wonderful thing to blue skies too. It's oversaturating the red, but that's easily sorted. You can always go in here and adjust any of these settings. So I could come down here to color range and just back the, uh, the red saturation back to where I like the look of it. I don't want to overdo it. And I might just drop the overall saturation. I'm really just changing some of the hues of the colors to a bit warmer, a bit more deserty feel. It's real subtle. So maybe even eh, super subtle, but I do like what it's doing. Uh, and then the final thing I'd probably do is add a custom vignette. And I just love the way that on one handles vignettes. So I go into the big softy. Uh, I will go ahead and drop its feather down so that I can see what it's doing. A nice hard edge this is what I talk about a feather. It's like that, that blend of where the effect is happening and where it's not. I'm going to reduce the size of this thing. I'm going to make it more round around her, and I want to target it for her face. I'm going to probably drop the size a little bit more. I really want this to be about her. And I'm going to grab this little targeting tool, and I'm just going to drag it to where I want it to be in the frame. I want it to be all about her face. And I'm going to go ahead and turn that feather back up so it's super soft, and then just slowly increase my brightness to where I get the look that I really want. I don't want to overdo the shadows, but I do want her to stand out. So, you know, what we just took what was a really nice looking photo, and when we go back to what it looked like before we started, what it looks like after, a pretty massive difference. Um, and all raw, that's one of the crazy things about all this. We're working masked, layered workflow. You know, we've got global adjustments. We've got finishing edits that are master layered. We have local adjustments we can do with graduated tools, with brushes, with radial tools, you know, whatever you want to work with. And it's all non-destructive. It's all just writing metadata instructions into that file uh, so that when you export a JPEG to share on the internet or via email, or you're sending a, a print file off to the lab, or you export a Photoshop document or a TIFF to do further editing in another piece of software, that's where the changes get baked in. Nothing is altered in your raw file. You can always go back to where you started. It's just super cool. Um, so, you know, that, that showcases, I think, what's maybe the coolest about Photo Raw. Some of the other things that have been incorporated, you know, we got that great fast HDR pano merging, which has just gotten consistently better since they first put it into Photo Raw 2018. They've introduced focus stacking. Uh, it's a little bit rudimentary at this point, but just like Panorama, they've, they've, they've pledged that they're just gonna continue to improve that product. And it's working pretty well with some images that I'm actually working on a, on a tutorial on that right now. So it's really fun software. I'm enjoying using it. Like I said, it's been super stable, even on my laptop system, even during the alpha phase, which was surprising to me. I've had very, very few crashes or stability issues with it, and particularly now, uh, with the full release. So great, great stuff. Um, so before I, I leave this approach in the scene, I want to answer a question that Steven put out there. Uh, he asked a couple really good questions and I'll, I'll hit them both. One, he said that he constantly sees me with these little, um, SSD drives connected to my computer 
and he asks, you know, what are they doing? Typic often he sees three of them. Well, when I work, work in Photo Raw, I pretty frequently just have two connected. Uh, one actually has the photographic data that I'm working with, particularly with these uh, newer computers that have smaller solid state hard drives. I like to keep the operating system and the software on the internal hard drive. I like to keep my photos on a separate hard drive. And whether I'm working in Photoshop or video editing software or on one, uh, I like to set a scratch drive um, and have an individual fast scratch drive that the software can write excess data when it, when it, can't, when it fills up RAM. For example, if I'm doing panoramic mergers and I'm using a ton of memory uh, or I'm just running a lot of software at one time, it can start caching to this fast little SSD drive instead of RAM if it starts to run low. Uh, so I have a scratch drive. And when I work in Lightroom, I keep my catalog for Lightroom on a little SSD drive and I find that it enhances performance. It's faster than if I have it on the internal hard drive, either on my laptop or on my, my modular newer Mac Pro back there. Um, I find that just not having that log jam where the operating system and the photo editing software and the data are all on the same drive, the catalog data, uh, it makes it fastest to have a separate pipeline a fast, you know, USB-C, SSD pipeline between the data and, the, and the, the central processing unit and the RAM, between the catalog, the scratch drive, and then have that operating system in the software just on your system drive. So that's why I have a ton of these little drives and I use them all the time. Second question was that back on my system behind me, He's noticed that there are two screens, one vertical, one horizontal, and he asked, you know, what are these screens? Well, they're NEC SpectraView screens connected to my 2013 era Mac Pro. Um, that's the little trash can that's modular. And both of those screens are 100% are Adobe RGB color space ready, so they, they display a wide gamut of color and they have automatic lookup tables so that if I hook a uh, monitor calibrator to them, they'll automatically calibrate themselves. Uh, the one on the right, the, well, yeah, the viewer's right, is actually a, a nicer screen. It has a little bit it's bigger, it has a little better color representation, it's newer. The one on the left is the one that I use for tools and web browsing, and the reason it's vertical is whether I'm working in Photoshop or whether I'm browsing the internet, things tend to be lined up Vertically, if you're reading a web page, you're scrolling, I have to scroll less. If I have a whole bunch of layers open in Photoshop, I have to scroll less. I'll show you really fast how I have it set up. So here I have Photo Raw 2019 open on the right, and I have a web page open on the left, and I can spread that Google Chrome page down and just see more of the web page all at once without doing as much scrolling. Here I have Photoshop open and my really color critical monitor on the right that I do my print proofing on uh, has the image with no interruption and I've got my history panel, my layers panel, my tool panels, everything laid out on the left screen and again a longer thing of panels so I can see more layers all at once, more history steps all at once without having to scroll. And then another really common thing I'll do is, you know, when I'm working in Lightroom, I have my little Lightroom catalog SSD hooked up to that Mac Pro system right now. I can keep a grid view on the right, on the left, and a loop view on the right. So, you know, just some really nice benefits. And the reason I go vertical is almost all those applications I just talked about, there's less scrolling to look through the grid of images if it's vertical. There's less scrolling to see the text on the screen on a website. There's less scrolling to see all the different history actions and movements that I've done in Photoshop if it's vertical. So that's the answer basically. And that's this approaching the scene. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, you know, I've got a link to Photo Raw 2019. If you've not tried it, it's a free 30 day trial what's the harm in giving it a shot, I think you'll be impressed. Uh, and, you know, the, the, thanks so much, Stephen, for submitting the question. I've got a bunch more questions coming for upcoming episodes. If you have a question, please join the conversation. Just go uh, to www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS and leave it there, or just email it to me at questions at hudsonhenry.com. Thanks so much for watching. 
you know, if you've made it to the end of the video, please make sure you click like, uh, click subscribe, and share it with your friends. Thanks. We'll see you next week.